In 1960, one of the largest marine construction armadas ever assembled began massing on the Chesapeake Bay. It had taken nearly three years of planning and design. Now, construction on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel was ready to begin. But building a bridge out at sea presented unique engineering problems. We put together a record of all the hurricanes that, of record that had hit the coast, in particular that area, what direction they came from, what kind of waves and storm surge did they create. Storm surge is a very important factor, and that, that's, that's how much tide you get above normal tide just due to a storm blowing. We had the designs for a huge storm surge and huge waves riding on top of that storm surge. Plans called for approximately 12 miles, nearly two-thirds of the crossing, to be low-level roadway trestles. To withstand the harshest winter storms, the trestles would be supported on three concrete tubes called pilings. Ideally, the base of the pilings would rest on bedrock. But bedrock in the bay lay 2,000 feet below ocean silt and sediment, far too deep to anchor the bridge. Instead, the bridge would have to find support in the shifting sand. The subsurface investigation was uh, very important to the design of the crossing. We took a series of, of borings out there to determine what the subsurface material was. And then um, studying those, uh, we found a, a layer of material. Depth varied, sometimes 100 feet, and sometimes 30 or 40 feet below the seabed that would support the piling with the loads we were going to put on it. But if engineers were wrong and the seafloor failed to support the weight, the bridge would sink to the bottom of the ocean. To guard against this, engineers drove test piles into the seafloor weighted with 320 tons. The piles settled, then stabilized. With the support questions answered, a 90-acre concrete yard costing three and a half million dollars was specially constructed near Cape Charles to build the estimated 2,580 piles for the project. The piles were formed from a steel wire, which was first shaped, then welded into a 16-foot long cylindrical cage. The cage was inserted and secured inside a casting mold, which in turn was loaded horizontally into a special device called a Senviro machine of the mold while removing excess water. The spun reinforced concrete piles were then steam cured for strengthening and coated with a hardening compound. A finished 16 foot section could be produced in four hours but required 28 days to properly cure. Workers then linked multiple sections, like beads on a necklace, to make the piles as long as necessary. The largest pile measured 172 feet. While workers at the concrete yard were busy with the pilings, survey teams were on the bay, confronting their own difficulties. Proper alignment of the bridge was mandatory, but proved difficult due to the tidal movement and shifting seafloor. Since much of the construction would happen out of sight of land, construction crews erected nine ocean survey towers and spaced them every two miles along the proposed crossing. You get out there in the middle somewhere and you don't see shore. And so it was simply the control from the survey towers that uh, kept things online. With their path properly defined, the bridge builders put their construction flotilla to work. Building the trestle and low-level road sections would fall to work crews manning three unique and specially constructed bridge building machines. The first step was to drive the piles that would form the legs of the trestle. During the construction, it was important to stabilize the equipment that was being used to drive the piles. Nicknamed the Big D, 
the enormous pile driver was a floating platform 70 feet wide, 150 feet long, and weighing 1,650 tons. Once towed into place, the Big D would rise out of the water on four hydraulic legs, each powered by 500 ton jacks. To countermand the forces of wind and waves, each trestle pier, called a vent, would consist of three piles. The middle pile would be driven vertically, while the two outside piles would be angled nearly five degrees. Crane operators would lift the piles, some weighing as much as 70 tons, off supply barges, and load them into the steam-powered driver. The piles were properly aligned by surveyors. Then, high-pressure water jets were used to blast pilot holes into the ocean floor. Finally, the Big D unleashed its 12-and-a-half-ton hammer, creating more than 60,000 foot-pounds of energy, piece of bridge-building equipment, to begin work. Known affectionately as the two-headed monster, this 177-foot traveling truss bridge would crawl across the tops of the support piles, piles, allowing workers to cut them to their proper height. Work crews would then place large metal caps, called a bonnet assembly, over the piles. Once in place, removable guide wheels were installed, and the two-headed monster pulled itself forward to the next set of piles. Crane operators at the rear of the two-headed monster finished the bents by lifting reinforced concrete caps from supply barges and lowering them across the three accurately cut piles. Work crews could now begin to install the roadway atop the finished trestle substructure. The road surface, like the pilings, was fabricated at the concrete yard near Cape Charles. Each 75-foot slab was constructed in an empty mold through which workers strung and tensioned steel cables. Crews then installed steel reinforcing mesh around the pre-tensioned wires and poured the concrete. After 24 hours, the slabs were removed from the mold and carefully stacked by construction crews to finish curing. Barges would transport the finished sections onto the bay, where crews manning a machine called the slab setter installed the road surface. This third unique piece of equipment utilized two steel girder trusses to bridge and pull itself across the finished pile beds. Crane operators lifted the road surface onto the bents, where three workers would properly align the slabs. Four slabs laid side by side would comprise the 28-foot wide roadway. The three construction goliaths were marvels and pushed forward around the clock. But still, they were no match for nature's fury. In the spring of 1962, a huge storm caught construction crews in the bay off guard. It happened on Ash Wednesday. And that's what they call the Ash Wednesday storm. Everything is uh, subject to Mother Nature, I'd say. And we got caught on one of those occasions. As a brutal nor'easter blew in off the Atlantic, Contractors frantically radioed their construction crews on the water, telling them to get to a safe harbor. But the contractor that had the big driver, he decided that he thought he could ride out the storm because he could jack it out of the water about 20 feet. And one of those huge waves got under the barge and lifted it and set it down kind of cattywampus on its legs and collapsed the legs on it. Though no one was injured, when the clouds had cleared, the $1.5 million Big D lay capsized and half-submerged in the Chesapeake Bay. 
I'll tell you a funny story. Somebody would say on the radio, where's the big D? Then somebody else say, bottom of the sea. <laughs> Work on the bridge ground to a halt as crews scrambled to build a new Big D with pieces salvaged from its predecessor. Through storms and mishaps, the roadway construction moved forward. But in the middle of the bay, crews were embarking on the most challenging portion of the project. Next, workers create new real estate in the open ocean, and engineers build a bridge at the bottom of the sea. But across the 17 and a half mile structure, they only deviate by half an inch. Modern marvels then and now will return in a moment. One, two, three! The History Channel. The Chesapeake Bay is one of the most heavily traveled waterways in the world. Every year, over 6,000 merchant vessels navigate the shipping channels. two shipping channels. One shipping channel goes up to the Baltimore area, known as the Chesapeake Channel. The other shipping channel is the Thimble Shoals Channel, which serves the uh, Norfolk Newport News area. Norfolk, Virginia is also home to the largest U.S. naval base on the East Coast. Countless warships, including aircraft carriers and discern, the nature. It was originally proposed to put high-level bridges over these two shipping channels. However, the Navy was quite concerned about, uh, in times of war, those high-level bridges could possibly be uh, sabotaged. The Navy worried that if bridge debris were to block the shipping lanes, the entire East Coast Naval Force would be trapped in the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, once it was decided that that would be a tunnel, why then we moved over to the other crossing, the Baltimore Channel and decided the tunnel would be appropriate there also. Two tunnels would need to be built, each stretching over a mile in length. The engineers decided that the best tunnel designed for the job would employ what is called the immersed tunnel method. And this involves building uh, sections of tunnel about three. Each 286 foot long individual tunnel piece was towed via tugboat 1,700 miles to the construction site. Remarkably, all 37 of the sections made the journey through the hurricane-prone Caribbean Sea and around the southern tip of Florida without incident. Once the tubes were safe in Norfolk, contractors poured tons of concrete to form the interior road surface and walls. It what we call negative buoyancy. That means that they would sink if you let them sink. But just barely. The lowering procedure had to be precise, a difficult task when dealing with the rough ocean currents. The tunnel builder's goal was to delicately place the 13,000 ton tube section into a trench 40 to 60 feet beneath the swirling waters. The engineers decided to use the environment to their advantage. They lowered the tubes at slack tide, the period between high and low tides, when the currents were nearly still. And at some point while he was lowering it, they would send the divers down to sit on those, on the platforms alongside of the tube, and they would guide the tube into position. And they'd bring it in to where the tube would just touch. They had a template on the tubes that a driver could drop about a one inch pin through these holes. If the pin went home, it was good alignment. Then, once the sections are joined up underwater and concreted together, then the uh, steel bulkheads are uh, cut out of the way and the uh, uh, final. To connect the trestle sections, the ends of each tunnel needed to be anchored into dry land, a scarce commodity in the middle of the bay. For the bridge designers, the answer was simple. Build an island. The study was done. It's a difficult uh, operation because you can't just place sand in, in a bay like this and expect it to stay in, in one place. The way it was done was to build what we call tow dikes, uh, rock berms around the periphery of the island, and then fill 
up to the top of those dikes and then built a second dike and filling up to the top of that dike and then progressively until you reach the surface. Roughly the size of Yankee Stadium, each island contains nearly 1,500,000 tons of sand and 300,000 tons of rock, painstakingly gathered from around the bay and lowered into place. Third island, we had it all concreted in, had rock backfilled around it, and about a day later, a hurricane hit. And after the hurricane had passed, we went out to survey and to see if that tube stayed in position. And our survey showed it had slid down the trench uh, 26 feet. The designers really had to scratch their heads. It had enough weight in it now that it couldn't be picked up. The solution was that the island was actually built out to, to meet the end of that tube. Work crews spent weeks fixing what had taken nature only hours to do expensive real estate in the world, costing roughly $5 million a piece, or $625,000 an acre. Technically less difficult, but of equal importance, two high-level bridges would also need to be built into the structure to allow commercial fishing and pleasure boats access to the eastern side of the bay. The bridge would be the larger of the two. Standing 75 feet above the water, it would be high enough for small and medium-sized boats to sail under. The shortest component of the bridge tunnel complex would be the fisherman's inlet bridge. The 475-foot span would allow 40 feet of clearance to boats using the busy waterways at the southern tip of the eastern shore. It's ever been attempted. The bridge opened to traffic on April 15, 1964. The construction schedule for the project was quite an incredible accomplishment. Uh, the entire project from the time it started until the time it was completed, it was only 42 months. Even in this day and age, that would be a record. With a 17-mile connection between Norfolk and the eastern shore complete, the bridge would help bring prosperity to the southern Chesapeake Bay region. The bridge and tunnel have become a well-used part of everyday life, offering transportation for the people of southeastern Virginia. With the bridge's completion, the ferry system had ceased to operate. Travelers have become completely dependent upon the bridge. That dependency would become painfully evident in the early morning hours of January 21st, 1970. During a fierce winter storm, the USS Yancey, a 450-foot Navy cargo ship, broke from its anchorage just 2,500 yards west of the bridge tunnel. As the wind gusting up to 50 miles per hour blew the ship towards the structure, the crew lowered the anchors to stop the vessel. With anchors dragging, the Yancey had nearly stopped when it impacted the bridge. But once it had made contact, the relentless wind caused the ship to continually batter the structure. Sailors worked frantically in the freezing rain to moor the ship to the bridge. But their efforts failed as the trestle section gave way in a shower of concrete. The, uh bridge tunnel was closed for 42 days until we, they could get the piles and, and drilling and put new bridge decks on. Well, being closed over a month and a half certainly disrupted the lives of the people on the eastern shore. Other factors began to affect the lives of regular bridge travelers. By the late 1980s, the district considered widening the crossing. The bridge was only a two-lane facility one lane in each direction with no shoulder. Cars that broke down on the bridge or impatient drivers who risked oncoming traffic to pass slow-moving vehicles were serious safety problems. The commission realized that a two-lane facility uh, could not handle the traffic uh, safely and efficiently in the future. For a company to design the structure. 
The difficulty would be tying the new bridge into the 30-year-old original. The company with a clear advantage was Ferdrup Engineering, the builder of the first crossing. A new generation of engineers and construction personnel would be called on to create this second parallel crossing. I'm real proud of my sons. They followed in my footsteps. Uh, Jim, he went to work for Sirdup also. He's been with them for 15 years now. It was an honor for me to work on this project. Having, my father having worked on the original one, I was born during the construction of the original one. Uh, I don't remember it. I remember seeing pictures of Same problems as their predecessors, as well as new complications brought on by the additional structure. Both the new and the original crossing are essentially at the mouth of Chesapeake Bay, and there's tidal flow in and out of the bay. So if there is obstruction there, the water has to flow in and out of the bay faster, and it goes faster around the obstructions, and then these obstructions would then cause scour or uh, digging out of the bay. Two structures, any closer, and the water turbulence would excavate sand from around the bridge supports. Construction began on June 16, 1995. The age-old problems of weather, sand, and currents still daunted the construction process. During the wintertime, it's vicious out there because the water temperature drops into the 40s and 50 degrees, and you get a breeze coming across there that cuts through you like a knife. It can be hard to stay warm in the winter, and it's viciously hot during the summer. But great strides in bridge engineering had been made in the 30 years since completion of the first span. A majority of the parallel crossing would consist of low-level trestle. Again, thousands of piles would need to be driven to support the structure. Workers would utilize a new jack-up barge, which was a technologically superior descendant of the Big D and Two-Headed Monster. This new barge would possess a digital edge. And this methodology is the pile dynamic analyzer. Change for the new bridge builders would come in the form of satellite-aided construction. Another advantage was the use of GPS, global positioning surveying, which was a lot easier from what they had to do on the, the original crossing, which was constructing surveying towers. Essentially, there's a transmitter that can be placed on the pile and it sends a signal to a, a satellite and the signal comes back and, and through a computer. 591 concrete piles for the new structure. With a price tag just under $200 million, the parallel crossing mirrored the old structure, except no new tunnels would be built. To reduce the cost, the new trestle sections tied directly into the existing tunnels. But due to growing traffic concerns, the future of the crossing will involve another mammoth construction project, the building of two new submerged tunnels. And we've always planned to build those additional tunnels. Uh, it's just that uh, money kept us from doing it. Our original thought was just to build two uh, tunnels fairly identical to the existing two tunnels we have at a uh, water depth of about 55 feet. But as shipmakers build larger, heavier ships, engineers must constantly reconsider tunnel depths to allow the deeper draft vessels enough clearance. We've taken a look at that, and we can do that by building a four-lane tunnel deeper than uh, the existing tunnel, tying that four-lane into our existing uh, four-lane trestles, and then abandoning the original two-lane tunnel. The commission estimates that the new tunnel complex could cost as much as $900 million. With no new tunnels being built, engineers and work crews had to seamlessly combine the existing structure with the new crossing. One of the big challenges on building the parallel crossing was to tie back in to utilize the existing tunnels. So we had to expand the, the portal islands out and allow for traffic to merge back in. Forty-six months after beginning construction, the new bridge opened to traffic on April 19, 1999. 
completion of the parallel crossing ushered in a new era for the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel. Next, after 35 years of service, the original span receives much needed repairs and the bridge undergoes an image overhaul. Federal law mandates that the entire Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel Complex be inspected every five years. Because it takes inspectors five years to cover the bridge, the job never ends. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel will be right back. Coming up at 7 on the History Channel.